So welcome everybody. Secure containers, <laughs> very generic title. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the security of specifically of your base images and our, uh, some stories about our experience with it and if and how Distoless could, could help you with it. Actually, we wanted to do it to uh, the two of us, but unfortunately, my, my colleague, just when we arrived with the bus, he had like serious pain in his uh, um, back now, so he's lying in the hotel. So I'm going to do it alone. We'll give a quick intro about our security challenge, our pain with development teams working in a central product security team. Then I'm going to present uh, component reduction methods and the distoless concept, and then followed by a demo, like a little bit life hacking demo. And in the end, there will be a little bit about our scientific research in that area with a comparison and a conclusion. So I want to start with this sentence. It's secure because it's running in a container. We get that sentence a lot, and I guess partially it's kind of true because it's isolated um, and processes are isolated from each other, they're isolated from the host. Um, but often this, this sentence also comes from non-technical guys don't uh, understanding um, technical issues like uh, Linux kernel features anyway. So we, we need a kind of a simple illustration to tell them, mm, even though your application is deployed in a container still, few things can go wrong. Also, another story, uh, we hear the sentence from, often from stakeholders, this uh, sentence comes that teams are not allowed to select any base image they want. And also, in that case, I need to brief <laughs> to, to bring myself in a peaceful mind and then tell them, yes, they are. They, they are allowed to um, select any base image they want. And I, I, what I bring is the comparison with open source components, because in my opinion, it's quite the same. As if you imagine a front-end application, if you select Angular, React, whatever framework you want, you, the develop, development team can decide. And so the development team can decide on, this, on the base images they want to use as base for their container image. And um, container images can have security vulnerabilities too. And this is the reason why we should scan them and continue scanning and monitoring more and more important uh, with companies moving to the clouds or coming to quickly about container image scanners. These are tools which statically scan your images for potential security vulnerabilities. They also find other stuff like uh, secrets, private keys, or something like this lying around in your image. And it's important to say that these tools are very easy to integrate in CI-CD pipelines, so you could, uh, we always recommend that you fail the build. If there, are, if there are issues, for example, a common policy is that if there are severities of critical and high, the pull request should fail and uh, should not be, not be allowed to merge in the development branch. And also there are limitations with these tools, so you have to, it's good, just good to know that these tools uh, don't detect any custom compiled code or stuff, so you should always use uh, official package managers uh, if you have to manually install the stuff. So, and now um, a little story about our pain. Uh, imagine us, we consult in a centralized product security team at a large enterprise, and there are a lot of applications moving to the cloud now. Legacy applications, or imagine a Java application 10 or 15 years old, should now get containerized. They had, some, had already some nice uh, talks with some people, and I guess this is like the typical, the typical thing companies want, are doing more and more. And then security gets more traction lately in the recent years. And then we come and management policies dictating that they are not allowed to deploy their containers to production if there are critical or high severity findings. And now imagine the application team, when, when our scanner detects 200 findings of critical and high severity coming to us and say like, hey, security team, it's the WTF moment. So first, we don't have time because we want to deploy in two weeks. And second, this has nothing to do with our application. This is it's not our responsibility, right? This is the, the stuff application teams then tell, tell us and like security team, uh, accept the risk. Yeah. But unfortunately, um, 
management policies dictate that these uh, issues should have have to be fixed before deploying to production. So this is just a little bit the, the story why we came to all this distoless and as we call it component reduction methods. So this is why I want to want to show you a few. Um, tools which are available. So I guess some of you have heard about Google and of course the buzzword distroless because Google uh, brought it up 2007 when they first released their open source project called Google distroless. They, what, what they do is they build it with Basel and they're providing some production ready images for certain runtimes like Java, Node.js, um, Python, C++ and stuff. And yeah, they are very small. So imagine you have a Go, Go application that you can use the static image. It's just two megabytes. Then also we have Ubuntu Chisel. It's pretty new, highly inspired by Google Distroless. Nice talk uh, from from the uh, from the guy behind it, and it's it's backed by Canonical, the open source com organization behind Ubuntu. And the nice thing here is that Ubuntu has this. Um, policy of fixing high and critical security vulnerabilities in, in, the, in a manner of 24 hours, so you get that. And they call it Chisel because what you do is you take as a base some Ubuntu distribution and uh, you chisel the components in you like and need. And then at the end you can even use from scratch and copy just copy your source code and everything from the base over and this is the way they uh, want you to build your image. And the third we have uh, Red Hat UBI Micro, coming from the Red Hat U Universal Base Images. The nice thing here is that Red Hat Enterprise Linux is uh, pretty well maintained. You get the same security response team, say, same security hardening as you have with any Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And also funny because this UBI Micro, if, if you Google for distroless, for sure, in the first five uh, results, you will find a blog post from Red Hat with a little bit of bashing against Google distroless. And you think like, okay, maybe this distress is not so what we because it comes from Reddit. But if you read it until the end, you see that it's just an advertisement for Reddit UBI Micro. <laughs> okay, so these are tools we made some good experience with, especially with Google Distress. But we are also in in the middle of kind of a research. But we come to this later. First, uh, we bring a little life hacking demo just to show you an example of. Uh, a certain class of attack and how to how this can be prevented with Google Distroless. So for this, I recorded it because I uh, don't want to blow it up here and don't want to leak certain IP addresses. So I hope you can see this. Try to play it. Is it is it okay? Can you read it? Everything? Uh, okay. So what what you see here is a, a Node.js application using Express Framework and it accepts HTTP. Uh, requests on the, on the root, and you can pass a query parameter Q, and if you don't pass it, it will just send an HTTP response, no parameter provided, And but if you pass one, it will execute a system command using Node.js uh, child process, and the argument for it will be direct user input. Now, of course, this is a very, very simple and very unsecure uh, example, but uh, trust me, there are way more complex implementations with exact this command injection vulnerability. So I already built it. So let's have a quick look at the Docker file. It's using Node 16 Bullseye as base. It uh, copies relevant source code over and installs its dependencies. And then just expose the port and run it. So of course, I want to try to run it now. Posing for 3000. Let's see if it's up. And now we, I'm going to test it with curl. So let's just try localhost 3000 now if it's working. As you see, it returns uh, HTTP response, no query parameter provided. So let's try a few examples. Let's try one. And as we know, it executes a shell command. Let's try a shell command like list directory. OK. You can see already we get the contents of, of the, um, the Docker container file system from the outside through this uh, exploiting this vulnerability. So now, interesting part, I have a remote server listening and some uh, V server I SSH'd into, and I, do, I start netcat listener on port 4445. So it's listening on the remote server, and now I want to exploit the, the Docker con uh, the running application with, with a certain um, 
payload, and don't worry, I have to uh, blur out the IP address, but what it's doing here, it's, it's running netcat against the IP address and the port 4445, injecting bash shell. So with the goal, we want to have a reverse shell from our remote machine into the container. So as you can see, if I fire this up, no res HTTP response coming back, and on the remote server, we get a connection. So at this point, we can try if it works. So let's see. OK, list directory, who am I? OK. So I got, um, I guess you, you get the point. I'm from a remote machine. Uh, I got the connect in. We are netcat reverse shell, and I can now move around in the file system of your container, right? And, and also, I'm root. Um, at this point, maybe I guess most of you uh, container uh, people know that, but there's this um, best practice in terms of security that the root, if you build your image, by default, Docker images are built with root, and this root user is the same root user as on the root user on your host, just as a side note. So and as we are root, we can also install stuff. So let's try to install a few tools. And then we get IF config. We can now check network, and we can use nmap to enumerate the network a little bit more. But of course, you get the point. We can do a lot more now. So we could, for example, try to exploit vulnerabilities found from scanners, because we can check the Linux version, and can see, can check public resources like National Vulnerability Database to, to check uh, what we could. And container exploits are not far away from here. So for this, this was for the, for the example. And now we, what we would what we want to do now in order to fix this class of attacks is we want to switch to Google Distro Less in that case. Uh, first, let's stop and kill our container, but uh, have a look in a Docker file. Google Distro Less works if you build it by a Docker file just in the second stage of your Docker file. You inst inst switch now to the Google Distro Less for the image you want and copy everything over from the base. And then it stays the same. Let's build it. Um, if you build it, you see in the middle already that it uh, fetches now from Google Cloud Registry. And let's run it and test it. So it's running. As you see, if you, if you do ls now, nothing coming back anymore. But the application itself is, of course, pretty important. We switched to this to less, way smaller image. Hopefully, everything nice. And uh, application is working fine, which is, of course, important. Now let's try to do the our com more complex uh, exploit again. It's not working anymore. No connection coming in. And now we want to see what's going on. So let's have a look at the logs. Just get the IP of the machine, and yeah, and don't worry, <laughs> have to blur this out. But as you can see in the, in the top, it just uh, throws an exception now that uh, that the application is trying to spawn a shell, which is not possible anymore. And this is this is a pretty nice thing. Um, yeah, maybe finally, just just a few notes about about scanning. So we scanned it with Trivi, it's an open source uh, container image scanner, and if we scanned it before switching to this list with, with this Node 16 bullseye image from Docker Hub, we would have 238 findings, of which 221 high and 17 critical. So this is like, this is the moment I told you before that the teams come like, what, what should we do with these kind of uh, um, with this amount of fi uh, findings? So if we switch to this to less, we only have two, zero critical, two high. So it drastically reduces the attack surface and also the, f the amount of findings, which is a good thing for a security team and for the application, and of course, also for the security of the image or the running application. So let me try to come back to the slides. Yes. OK, at this point, just a quick uh, insight into our research, because we think it's always a good idea to have uh, um, our um, decisions based on scientific facts. And uh, with, we with Secure.io um, have several years of collaboration with the University of Applied Sciences in Augsburg. And lately, we joined a, a small research on container security, specifically going into the base image um, direction. And we have decided on three research questions. First one being, again, if, if a reduction of components indeed will uh, drastically or significantly reduce the findings of these container image scanners. Secondly, we also want to know if typical 
vulnerabilities found by these scanners are indeed exploitable and therefore a risk to application because lots of applications coming to us and say, yeah, this um, curl vulnerability finding here, critical curl version one, blah, blah, has nothing to do with our application. And we want to, of course, we, want, we are interested in if it's really not exploitable in the context of their application. For example, sometimes you have a Bluetooth finding, which, which are just, of course, these tools bring false positives because they are kernel headers uh, with Bluetooth and the normal, normal web application doesn't have anything to do with Bluetooth. So you can, of course, ignore these kinds. So we want a little bit categorizing of, of findings and check if there are risks to the application. And third, we also want to see implications on application development lifecycle when integrating these methods. So as with any research, we did a little bit of related work research and uh, regarding the first research question, we found a pretty nice paper from 2022 comparing Google Distillers uh, to, with, uh, with a few public well-known like JDK and uh, Node.js or Python, yeah. And what, what it concludes is that there's not always a positive correlation between the size of, of your image and the amount of vulnerabilities. For example, with the JDK images in Google Distillers, at least, you still get around 50 findings, but they see positive uh, correlation uh, for, for other, like Node.js, Python, they mentioned. Yes. Another interesting paper from 2014, this is a little bit more regarding research question two. So they are comparing, they're not only checking national vulnerabilities, so I'm not sure for those who are not so familiar with, with vulnerability tracking, there's this called CVEs, it's basically an ID for a security vulnerability, and these get, get calculated a score based on the three protection goals of information security. But this is just a, the normal calculation done, and this will give you critical or high whatever, whatever severity for, for a finding. But what, what this study is doing is it also compares exploit databases and also exploits available in the black market, like find in the deep net, we can buy with Bitcoin or something. And uh, ex exploits happen in the wild, like ha exploits really happened in the wild. And what they conclude is pretty interesting because Normally, management policies dictate you have to fix all critical and high vulnerabilities. But this study, already 2014, concluded that fixing a vulnerability just because it has a high score is like more or less equivalent to, f to randomly picking one. And they say that it's a way better risk factor to, to in incorporate more resources, like, like said, exploit DB or, or black matter or exploit it in the wild. So. Pretty, uh, just pretty interesting paper in that direction. And the third one is just a little bit more for the baseline that, that it's, it's again, it says again that high exploitability vulnerabilities and high impact vulnerabilities are found more in large base operating system images. So this was just a small insight in our research. This is still going on. If you, if you like, if you're interested in results, you can follow us and uh, expect results around December, end of the year. So we're just getting started into this. Um, yeah. So coming now again to, to the advantages of, of these distillers methods. Um, you basically get minimal images. It contains only the runtime environment, no shells, no package managers, no, no stuff your application doesn't need anyway. Um, and therefore, we have produced attack surface, even proved more or less the scientific research. Um, and of course, w less findings of container scanners, which is a, a big advantage from a security team point of view. It removes entire classes of attacks, like, like I showed, these shell kind of attacks get removed. And, and also, you get faster transfer, fa uh, less storage, and therefore less costs with them. I imagine the image just two megabytes. And also, you get faster build times, which is a good thing in terms of uh, Dev, DevOps and all that continuous integration uh, topics. Yeah. But also, of course, we have some disadvantages. I would rather call it challenges. Of course, the first one is uh, like the first two, like complexity and uh, compatibility issues. Because I will just bring an example in a second that um, you really have to understand underlying technology if you want to integrate these um, distillers concepts. Because you have to know uh, 
about kernel I.O., you have to know about file system, Linux kernel features and, and stuff. But it's always a good idea, of course, to better understand. And we also learned something with it on, the, on, the, on our part. Also, you have, of course, the issue with debugging. I guess some of you already had the question in your mind, like, OK, there is no shell, so how should I debug my image? How, sh how, should, I get something, how should I get inside? So for example, with Google Distrolist, they are providing a debug tag you can use, and then you get a small busy box so that uh, you can execute a shell inside. And for one team, we, we helped integrating it. They, they also needed to uh, run their integration tests from within the image. So what they do is, in the, in the development pipeline, they just build it with the debug tag, run the integration tests from within. And for the de production deployment pipeline, they just remove the tag. Yes. And also, there is no support for certain languages. So for example, Google Distrolist has no PHP support, but we tried it with Ubuntu Chisel. So building, building it on your own is like more or less pretty easy. And there is a fork available, for example, if you want to have it with Google Distrolist. Yeah. So far to the challenges. And now, finally, a little example of, of one of the challenges we had when we integrated it in a Node.js application. So we told the team, please, if you, it would be nice if you try it. So they tried it, and uh, they said, runtime error. So we cannot run an applic application. Security team, please help us. And then we checked, and we saw that it's a runtime error because they're using a a Node.js library for Kafka, which in turn is just a wrapper for a C, C++ Kafka library. And this, in turn, depends on a compression support library, which is normally lying around in, in a normal Linux distribution, but it was not available in the Google Distrolet image. And therefore, we found out that with Linux, you can use the LDD command to get uh, shared object dependencies of a binary. And then we found out, OK, this is the, the missing missing piece here. And the solution in the end is then that you, in your first stage, you install it manually, like with apt, you can install setlib. And in the second stage, you copy, copy it to the correct location where the library expects it. And this fixed it. And now this, for this Node.js application running in production for a few months and coming from 230 findings to two. And yeah, they are happy with it. So conclusion here, again, uh, good understanding is, is always a good idea for the technology you're using. And yeah, it's coming to the end. So for the conclusion, I have, of course, three points um, I want to give you. So the first, again, teams are responsible for the selection of their base images and their, their security, because hackers don't care which part they take to exploit your application. Second is uh, Google Distrolist can make your application more secure, um, reduce the attack surface, um, but it depends on your application architecture. In our opinion, it was good uh, for microservices-based architectures where you have small services doing not much, so it fits quite well with this kind of architecture. And a few recommendations we want to give um, is Again, scan your image if you not do it uh, already, and fail your build. So this would be like the first recommendation in an ideal world. We, from a security point of view, would would love to see. And also, do not build your images as root. We see that so often, like so, because the, our scanners also do these compliance checks where they're checking your images built as uh, root. And um, as you saw in the demo, and also I, I hope you know that, that the root inside the container is just the same PID in Linux as the root on the host, which is like a pretty big issue. And also, we made good experience with, with the kind of awareness and community approach around it. So if, if in your company, uh, multiple teams uh, want to integrate this to less, or kind of a, it would be nice if you create kind of a shared knowledge base, uh, like an FAQ or something to share. Uh, share knowledge um, around certain issues, like I showed just in the slide before. And also, um, of course, you could use cloud workload protection and Kubernetes security features, and you should. Um, for example, with cloud workload protection, you could also set up policies which doesn't allow uh, the application to spawn a shell. Yeah, but not, uh, not all companies are using cloud workload protection. It's not so easy and so cheap. So, yeah. So. I would say that's it. I'm sorry that the other Michael couldn't join, but uh, hope you enjoyed it and thanks for listening. Yeah.
Thank you very much, Michael. Um, so now, please go on Slido and start asking questions. So it should come up on the screen now. Yes, so you can join Slido with this code or scanning the QR code. And I also already see we have some interesting questions, so that's good. Whoa. So to kick it off <laughs> with the first one, what to do if use tools, cascading dependencies, bloat your chisel di distros? OK, I guess you mean um with cascading the dependencies, I guess you mean dependencies of the application itself. I mean, if you mean that, you cannot do anything because if the dependencies and application needs to come in anyway. So, uh, so I'm not sure I would ask back if what, what you mean. Uh, Lips cascading dependencies. I can just think of the application dependencies like the open source components. So, and they have to come in anyway, right? So. Okay, so we have the next one. Uh, we already touched. You already touched upon this a bit, and I see a couple of questions in about mm. debugging of distroless yeah. containers. Do you have any best practices? To be honest, no, because I'm not so familiar with Kubernetes already. Yeah, so not sure. But I, yeah, I cannot say. Maybe we can have a chat on it. Yeah. Cool. So we have another question. So do you see? that distral is becoming a predominant <laughs> use type of images? I mean, this is subjective, but I, I have to say, um, with, in the enterprise we're working in, the teams are not so motivated to, to put it into practice. I mean, although it would make a lot of sense, but you have these hurdles and the complexity and compatibility issues, so I'm not sure, but I can imagine that the trend is going to more minimal images and we have the microservice architecture anyway and so I mean it's subjective but I, I would say yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least hopefully from a security yeah. standpoint right yeah <laughs> yes so the next one is have you checked out chain guard images they are significantly oh, smaller and safer than distroless images to be honest no but I guess I will yeah <laughs> Good. Well, it's Check always out. interesting for me to see that somebody claims zero CVEs. Like, yeah, that's like. Yeah, I'm gonna look into that. <laughs> yeah. Um, then we do the next one. Have you considered also using Vex to gather actual exploitability information? No, to be honest, not. <laughs> interesting questions for sure. What about compatibility with security tooling like CVE scanner, supply chain security standards like Cyclone DX? Oh, yeah. Um, it's important to note that, for example, Trivi is a famous open source um, container image scanner, and they're explicitly listing Google Distroless as, um, as part of their supported image types. So I, I guess you have to check. Um, I'm not sure what Cyclone DX, uh, never heard about this one. But I guess you have to read in the documentation of the tools if they're supporting Google Distroless. And that's also the limitation I told you in the beginning, like that most of the container image scanners cannot detect custom compiled, compiled code or Peckle installed, whatever. You have to use official package managers. So these tools are able to detect them. Good. So we got a couple of upvoted questions. So this one, to build your own Distroless images, is there any tool you would recommend for like Docker Slim? Um, to be honest, uh, we, we just built it uh, by hand, yeah. So without without any other tool, yeah. And this is the, the few applications we 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 did it with. They just do it like this as well, to, at least to my knowledge, yeah. 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 Cool. Then we got another one. Let's see. Yeah, I can see this work for custom images, but where would you see a similar approach with regard to third party slash upstream images? Ah, uh, yeah. No, to be honest, we, we have a lot of uh, commercial off the shelf applications providing, like, uh, large enterprises providing uh, images for their um, 
commercial off the shelf apps and if we if we scan them already have lots of findings but as normally for third party we don't have any access so but i guess there are some tools where you can put in a final image uh, and they they will do some component reduction, but this is not what, what we did with, with these two, three approaches uh, I showed you. So, to be honest, not sure what, what you could do with third party stuff. Yeah, we're focusing more on custom developed code with it. Yeah. And I guess those enterprises would have to like, adopt this themselves. Then. Yeah, that's what I mean. Sure. They could do this when they build their images before they bring it out as a yeah. product. Yeah. Two more questions. So, one question about x86. So, what are your experiences with ARM and Distril? Is still early or ready to go outside of x86? Uh, to be honest, <laughs> I didn't check it at all. <laughs> so, I guess they're all x86, and I cannot answer, but maybe we can chat on it later. Yeah. And then the last one is do the Distrilis Alternatives from Ubuntu or Reddit also limit to certain programming languages. So they, they don't uh, support it officially, like the Google Distal List images. So, for example, Ubuntu Chisel, they have um, for .NET, they have a prod ready image, like you, where you can just plug and play. But for the all, all the others, in Ubuntu Chisel is quite an early stage, I would say. And also, Reddit, they just have documentation on how to build it. For example, they have an example for Java, but uh, if you need. Any other language, I guess you have to follow the documentation and build it your own. So Google Distress is a little bit more plug and play for all the languages, but the others, so that to our knowledge, you have to um, go through the docs and build it your own. Yeah. So Michael, thank you so much yeah. for answering all of the questions the audience had. And give it up one more time for Michael Wager. Thank you.